Following a four-year search, during which time he endured bullying at different schools, Kano found a jiu-jitsu teacher willing to teach him. Through the recommendation of a physical therapist and a former jiu-jitsu teacher, Teinosuke Yagi, Kano met master Hachinosuke Fukuda. Kano explains in his memoirs what he learned at the Fukuda Dojo and in his formative years of jiu-jitsu training. I left Yagi's clinic and went directly to the Fukuda Dojo. It consisted of a 10 mat room with a stairway in one corner. The practice area was thus reduced to 9 mats. There was an adjacent room of 3 mats where Fukuda treated his patients. Consequently, the 9 mat dojo was also used as a waiting room for Fukuda's patients. It was there in that cramped dojo that I began my longed for pursuit of the ancient secrets of Jiu Jitsu. The style taught there was Tenjin Shinyo that had been created by Master Mataemon Iso, who had combined two of the older styles, the Yoshin and the Shin no Shinto. When I joined the dojo, Fukuda had but five students. Of these, only two trained regularly. One student practiced every day, the other every two days. Fukuda was formerly an instructor in Jiu-Jitsu at the Kobusho, the government-run military training center where many of the offspring of samurai were trained in the full gamut of traditional martial arts. In addition, trainees received instruction in the use of cannon and small arms. His position there was equal to that of a university assistant professor. At the Kobusho, several styles of Jiu-Jitsu were taught. Among them were the Kito style and the Yoshin style. Occasionally, contests were held between those trained in Tenjin Shinyo and those trained in other styles. The most popular style in those days was the Yoshin. Master Hikosuke Totsuka was employed there and he had a large contingent of well-trained young men. Although Fukuda was an expert, in practice sessions against the Yoshin style of the Totsuka men, I heard that he was very hard pressed. The two men that I trained with most frequently in my early days at the Fukuda Dojo were Mr. Aoki, a local fish wholesaler, Kanekichi Fukushima, although Fukushima weighed some 90 kilograms, was physically strong and skillful. He knew very little about the theoretical side of jujitsu or kata. I learned kata daily from Fukuda. I did physical training exercises and often practiced randori with Aoki. Sometimes though, when Aoki was absent and Fukuda was injured, I had no partner. At that time, Fukuda made me practice breakfalls on my own. On some occasions, I had no training partner for several days in a row. Nevertheless, I still went to the dojo daily and did much physical exercise. In those days, teaching methods were quite different from today. One method that I recall in particular was the day when Fukuda threw me down repeatedly. I immediately picked myself up the first time and asked him to explain how he did the throw. He merely said, attack again which I did and he threw me down once more. I faced him and repeated my question. Fukuda would only say, come on, and yet again I was thrown. He then shouted, do you think you will learn jiu-jitsu by mere explanations each time? Attack again. Once more I was thrown to the mat. By this method he taught me how to do the throw by my experiencing the sensation of being pulled off balance and thrown by that particular technique. As I recall, the throw I learned very quickly that day was sumigayashi. As I mentioned earlier, there were few trainees practicing regularly at Fukuda's dojo at that time. Since I was extremely keen to learn jiu-jitsu, I desperately needed more training partners. I therefore made earnest efforts to recruit some of my fellow university students and ask them to accompany me to the dojo with a view to persuading them to take up the practice of jiu-jitsu. Unfortunately, most of them soon quit. My best friend, Yu Saku Godai, however, continued with training for a time, but he later had to leave Tokyo and move to Yokosuka in order to complete his studies for his doctorate in engineering. He therefore gave up jiu-jitsu training entirely. This was a big disappointment for me. Had he continued to train, I have no doubt that he would have become an expert in martial arts. Perhaps the most memorable event of my days at the Fukuda Dojo occurred in 1879 when US President Ulysses Simpson Grant visited Japan on his world tour. 
The noted industrialist and philanthropist Eiichi Shibusawa, who later became an associate of mine, wished to entertain the president and his entourage with a demonstration of jiu-jitsu. Shibusawa contacted Masatomo Iso and other jiu-jitsu masters and invited them to his summer residence in Asuyama in order to stage a display in honor of the president's visit. Godai and I were called upon to give an exhibition of randori. The well-known U.S. columnist Julian Street wrote an account of our demonstration which later appeared in the press. In August 1879, shortly after this event, Master Fukuda collapsed and died. At that time, there were a number of other trainees at the dojo who were more skilled in randori than I. However, since I was the only one who regularly attended the training sessions and thus had a fair knowledge of both randori and kata, I was asked by Mrs. Fukuda to take possession of the densho and become the new master of the dojo. In all honesty though, I felt I had neither the necessary skills nor the courage to assume this responsibility. Nevertheless, I found it difficult to decline Mrs. Fukuda's earnest request and so I finally accepted, though with some reluctance. One day, while I was in charge of classes at the Fukuda Dojo, a man who claimed to be an expert in the Honden Miura style of Jiu-Jitsu came on an unexpected visit to our dojo and challenged us to a contest, which I felt we had to accept. He was extremely confident of his prowess and proudly boasted that we were no match for his style of Jiu-Jitsu. At that time, I was not the most skilled in the Fukuda Dojo. I still lacked confidence, so I was naturally a little anxious at the prospect of competing against his team members. If we lost this contest to the Honden Miura school, it would have lowered not only my reputation but also that of our dojo. I asked and received the support of the other trainees and we all agreed on a date and a time for a team contest. With this, the man left. On the appointed day, our team assembled in the dojo somewhat apprehensively and we waited for our opponents to arrive. However, they failed to show up. The man was obviously a braggart. I recall another anecdote from my days at the Fukuda Dojo. Normally, I did not have a particularly hard time when practicing with Aoki and the other trainees. In the case of Fukushima, however, it was a completely different story. I could not overcome the strength nor disturb the balance of Kanekichi Fukushima, no matter how hard or how often I tried. Finally, I resolved that I would learn to throw him somehow or other. After giving the matter a great deal of thought, I decided that a sumo technique might be effective against him. Upon hearing that a former sumo man, Kisoemon Uchiyama, worked at my university dormitory, I requested him to teach me sumo techniques. The sumo throws that I learned from him, however, proved to be totally ineffective against Fukushima. It then occurred to me to research books on western-style wrestling, so I went to my local public library in Yushima Bunkyo Ward. Unfortunately, from among the wrestling books available, there did not seem to be any throw that I could use on Fukushima, except one that I thought just might be effective against him, since Fukushima was taller than I. This throw was a shoulder wheel, or kataguruma. I experimented with it on one of my student friends soon after reading about it and succeeded in throwing him. I also tried it on Aoki with the same result. On my next visit to the dojo, therefore, I challenged Fukushima to a practice and for the first time in my life, I successfully threw him with my newly acquired technique. After many months of trying, I had finally managed to down him. I was overjoyed and felt a great sense of achievement. Following the untimely death of Master Fukuda at the age of 52, I was for a time obliged to assume responsibility for teaching the other students at the Fukuda Dojo, even though I had neither the experience nor the self-assurance to do so. Despite Fukuda's passing, I had not, however, given up my resolve to become totally skilled in jiu-jitsu and I was fully aware of the reputation of the famous Iso school of Tenjin Shinyo Jiu-Jitsu that had been founded by Master Masaemon Iso. His successor was Masaichiro Iso and although employed as an instructor at the Kobusho, Masaichiro was not a particularly well-known jiu-jitsu man and was reportedly not very successful in contest. He, similar to Fukuda, also died at an early age. The third generation master was Masatomo Iso, who was better known and had been Fukuda's teacher. Iso ran his dojo in Otamagaike Kanda, Tokyo, 
After much thought, I decided that it would be in my best interests to enroll at Masatomo Iso's dojo in an effort to improve myself further in jiu-jitsu. At that time, Master Iso was over 60 years old. Though he no longer practiced randori, he continued to give in-depth instruction in kata, for which he was a well-known expert. He had appointed two of his ablest students, Sato and Muramatsu, to stand in for him in the randori training sessions and therefore I received initial coaching in randori from both of them. Because I had trained hard at the Fukuda Dojo and had acquired a fair amount of experience, I soon gained great benefit from their further instruction, so much so that I was eventually called upon to become an assistant instructor at the Iso Dojo. Although short in stature, Masatomo Iso was of sturdy physique. Even in his younger days, he was noted more for his knowledge of kata than for skill in randori. Therefore, I did not learn many randori skills from him, but I did learn a great deal of kata technique. By teaching and practicing with his students, I gained much that I was able to use to my advantage in furthering my skills in randori practice. In my days at the Iso Dojo, some 30 or so fellow members practiced regularly every evening. Because the two other assistant teachers were sometimes absent, I alone had to lead the training sessions. Unlike today, the main practice session in those days was not considered to be randori, but kata. Customarily, we did kata training first, followed by randori. Having to do randori nightly with 30 or so partners proved to be quite an arduous task for me. I used to leave for the dojo after an early dinner and arrive back home late, sometimes well after 11pm. Because my legs hurt so much following the hard training and exercise sessions, I had difficulty walking in a straight line and occasionally stumbled and fell down. When I now recall those far off days, I am somewhat surprised that I did not succumb to illness. As time went by, the visits to the dojo of both Sato and Muramatsu became much less frequent. I, however, still very keen, continued my practice of Tenjin Shinyo Jiu-Jitsu regularly every night. In June 1881, Master Iso died. For the second time I was left without a jiu-jitsu instructor and I again had the difficulty of finding yet another master. It so happened that one of my student day elder acquaintances was Masahisa Motoyama, who in 1878 had become one of the first students to graduate from the law department at Tokyo University. Although we were in different departments while students, we were nevertheless members of the same baseball team and became close friends. Ryusaku Kodai and I were pitchers for the team. Masahisa Motoyama and one of the other students were catchers. Accordingly, Motoyama and I associated with one another and often went hiking and rowing together. I later learned that Motoyama's father was a well-known expert in Kito-style jiu-jitsu and that he had formerly instructed at the Kobusho. Naturally, my curiosity was aroused and for this reason I hit upon the idea of learning from his father, Master Motoyama, the Kito style of jiu-jitsu a style that was unknown to me. Because his father was by then quite elderly, he taught only kata. He was no longer able to practice or even willing to teach randori skills. Owing to my persistence though, Master Motoyama finally relented and agreed to introduce me to a good instructor whom he had known from his younger days. He told me that this man's name was Tsunetoshi Ikubo and that he had taught for a time at the Kobusho. Shortly thereafter, I was introduced to Ikubo, from whom I subsequently took lessons in Kito style Jiu Jitsu. Surprisingly to me, the Kito style was very different from the Tenjin Shinyo style Jiu Jitsu, to which I had by then become well accustomed. In Tenjin Shinyo, there were a range of strangulation techniques and groundwork hold downs. On the other hand, the Kito style, rather than hold downs, comprises a wide range of effective throwing techniques. There are a number of sacrifice throws together with several foot and several hip throws that I had never seen before. I therefore soon discovered more ways of throwing an assailant to the ground. When I met Master Ikubo, he was already over 50 years old. Nevertheless, he was still remarkably skillful in randori and had stamina enough to train hard. At first, and for some considerable time thereafter, I was no match for the formidable randori skills of Master Ikubo. Also, the Kito Kata that I learned from Ikubo was somewhat different from that of Tenjin Shinyo style Kata. 
Since I found the wide variety of Kito Jiu Jitsu throwing techniques so fascinating, I studied them painstakingly and practiced them relentlessly. During my student days, I lived in lodgings, but soon after becoming a lecturer at Gakushuin, I decided to move out and set up house for myself. Shortly thereafter, I was requested to coach some students in preparation for their university entrance examinations. Because the number of my private live-in students quickly grew, I needed to move to larger premises. As a result, in February 1882, I made a decision to rent rooms in a temple named Eishoji in Shitaya Kita Inaricho, present-day Higashi Ueno, Tokyo. I chose two rooms for my own personal use, one of which I used as a study. The other rooms were for the use of my students. The largest room available were used as a jiu-jitsu dojo, not only for my academic students but also for others who came wishing to learn jiu-jitsu only. I engaged Master Ikubo to teach both kata and randori. Among my live-in students at that time were Tsunejiro Tomita, currently 6th stand grade, and the very skillful Shiro Saigo. An anecdote from those days concerned the problems stemming from the loose floorboards that were directly below the mats of the dojo. Repairs were eventually needed following the months of constant pounding by falling bodies. One night, Tomita and I decided to fix them. Tomita crawled underneath the temple veranda while I held the lantern. The head priest was worried. He complained that the vibrations resulting from the crashing of bodies during our practice sessions had made the memorial tablets in the room next to the dojo fall on the floor. Not only that, but some of the roof tiles had become dislodged and had fallen down too. Finally, the head priest seemed afraid that we would eventually wreck the temple completely and asked us to stop using the main room as a jiu-jitsu dojo. After much thought, I decided to have a new and sturdy purpose-built 12-mat dojo constructed next to one of the gates in the temple grounds. This I named Kodokan.